In combinational circuits, the outputs of the circuit are dependent solely on the current inputs of the circuit. But if you recall when we talked about the nature of computing, we require the passage of time. Specifically, the idea that a input stimulus in one circumstance will produce one output, but the same stimulus at a different time or under different circumstances will produce a different output. And the reason is because it's not just the stimulus, the input, determining the output like it is in combinational circuits. It's the input combined with the current state, which is a result, of course, of the history of other states that the machine has been in. In this video, we're going to look at sequential circuits, which reflect this. Particularly, we're going to investigate memories, latches, and flip-flops. But before we can do that, we need to understand a little bit about the circuits that manage our time. These are the clocking circuits. So to start, we need to see that uh, every system is going to have one or more uh, clocks. And they're typically what we call a symmetric periodic clock, or more often we just say a symmetric clock. Uh, when we draw these in circuit diagrams, we usually use this little uh, top hat style symbol. Uh, but what we mean is a signal that over time goes from a low voltage value of zero to a near instantaneous switch to a high value. Now it's really not instantaneous. Uh, there's actually a quick uh, steep curve here uh, and kind of a little bouncy wiggly stabilization period. But digitally, we're going to think of this as going from zero to one, back to zero, and back to one. Now what makes it symmetric is that if we look over the length of a individual wave, so if we look over one wavelength, we will find that the amount of time spent with a high value is the same as the amount of time spent with a low value. Now uh, that wavelength uh, is from either the beginning of a high to the end of a low, or from the beginning of a low to the end of the high. They'll be the same in a periodic symmetric clock. Now, how long it takes to actually get from uh, the beginning of one wave uh, to the beginning of the next wave, that length of time is called the period. And the period relates directly to something called frequency. So we may talk about uh, the speed of our processors in terms uh, of hertz with some other um, prefix there. So we might be talking today about gigahertz machines, uh, in embedded systems, we may be looking at megahertz machines uh, or even kilohertz machines. Uh, and hertz is just, uh, uh, or HZ, is an abbreviation for hertz, which is a reference to how many times uh, per second, how many periods of a particular wave per second. And that's what the frequency is. So to put that in more mathematical terms, uh, we find that the period is the inverse of the frequency. And then, of course, we can take the reciprocal of that and see that the frequency is then uh, the inverse of the period. And we may want to know either from the other. Uh, and so it's important to note the recipro this, these reciprocals. So let's say we have a 100 megahertz processor, which would be completely reasonable uh, for some kind of commercial embedded device today, um, doing uh, some specific job, maybe some um, fiber optic test equipment, that kind of thing. We know that it has a 100 megahertz uh, CPU speed, at least that's the frequency uh, of the CPU, and we would like to know what is the period of that clock. So what we can do is we'll start with the 100 megahertz here and say, okay, well, 100 megahertz, uh, in this case, the mega is um, talking about how many of something and not bytes uh, for storage, so uh, we're instead going to be looking at powers of 10 and not powers of 2. So really this is 100, and mega gets us into the millions, 100 million uh, is equivalent to the 100 megahertz. What is this in terms of powers of 10? Well, let's see, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this is the same thing as 10 to the 8th. That's effectively what our frequency is, 10 to the 8th hertz. So if we want to know what the period is, given the frequency, we just take the inverse of this. So we know then that the period, 
is going to be equal to 10 to the negative eighth uh, seconds. But uh, what is that? Well, uh, one nanosecond is 10 to the ninth seconds. So if we wanted to put this in terms of nanoseconds, we would have to multiply this by 10, thereby uh, increasing its exponent by 1, which would take it from negative 9 to negative 8, which really means that this side of this equation is also multiplied by 10. And so the period is 10 nanoseconds. Now, we use clock circuits uh, to control when memories uh, in our sequential circuits are updated. So uh, every sequential circuit, every circuit that has an internal state must have a memory. And that is really the key to the study of sequential circuits, is understanding memory. So we need to ensure that we can utilize the clock to tell these circuits when to do a particular thing. So here is a simple circuit which will appear at first to have very little value. Uh, in this case, we are taking a clock, uh, running it down a wire, through an inverter. Remember, this is a, uh, a buffer in front of an inversion bubble, just so that we can see which direction the uh, data flow is on this particular wire. But this little uh, buffered inverter is not only going to produce an inversion of the clock signal. So instead of going low, then high, then low, then high, if we do this, it will start off high, then go low, then go high, then go low. It just outputs the exact opposite of the primary clock. But this inverter causes a tiny, tiny delay. And that tiny delay can be leveraged. So here is what we use it for. Here is a circuit, a very simple circuit. We run the regular clock directly down a wire into an AND gate. And remember that AND will only produce a 1 as output if all of its inputs are 1. Now we take that clock line and we run off a duplicate of it and we invert it. And that goes into the AND gate as well. So it, at first, it may seem that this circuit uh, will effectively always produce a 0. After all, when the clock is high, the invert of the clock will be low and 0 anded with 1 is 0. And if the main clock is low, then the inverted clock will be high, and the main clock being low is a 0, so 0 anded with the other 1 is still going to give you 0. But there was that tiny delay introduced by the inverter. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. If you look at this timing diagram, uh, this is wildly out of scale, so we're not really getting to see how small this is. What's going to happen is we have at point A the normal clock, low, high, low, high, low. B will be an inversion of that clock, but this inverter creates a little delay, so you see a small gap right here, and then it begins the period of high voltage, which is the inverse of this low voltage. And when A goes high, it takes that same period of time before B is able to get um, produce new output that is suddenly low. And that means for a brief period of time in between, uh, say, this dotted line and this little dotted line, when the primary clock goes from a low to high value, there is a little period of time where A is high and B is high. In this case, the AND gate is going to go from its low value suddenly to a high value, and we can see that reflected in this diagram below. Now, almost immediately B will go back low, and so does our output over here, C. And so, where there used to be a transition from low to high, we suddenly have a little bloop, and that's nice because this can work as what we call a trigger. Now, when A goes low, shortly after that, B will go high. But this doesn't change the output of our clock, because of our fabricated clock, because once B goes high, A is already low, and so we have a zero input to the AND gate, along with a high input to the AND gate, and that's still going to be producing zero. So this simple circuit uh, 
uh, taking a clock and anding it with the inversion of the clock itself is going to produce a new type of triggering clock. It's a rising edge trigger because on the rising edge, the low to high transition of the real clock, we're going to get a triggerish style bloop on our fabricated clock. And we represent that with this kind of drawing. Now, in some circumstances, we may also want to produce a falling edge trigger, and we can do that with nearly the same circuit. We just replace the AND gate with a NOR gate. And uh, I'll let you work that one out by yourself to see how that functions, but that gives us a falling edge. And if we wanted a triggering clock that is twice as fast as the original one, we can actually just OR uh, the rising edge trigger clock and a falling edge trigger clock together so that we get little bleeps on the rising edge and on each falling edge. And so where we otherwise had a, had a bleep once per period for either the rising and falling edge, we would then have doubled that speed. All right, so let's now look at some primitive memory, which will eventually end up utilizing a clock. All right, so the most primitive memory I can show you is something like this. There is a wire right here, uh, and it's got some uh, value on it. Uh, and that value goes into an inverter, and then it goes into another inverter, both of which delay uh, the propagation of the signal just a little bit. And then the output of that is rerouted back to the front. Now, this is generally referred to as jogging the memory because if we were to just say somehow put a one on this wire uh, and send it down a plain wire by itself, the one would just go off on the other end and as soon as we took the voltage level off the wire, uh, very shortly after that it would go away from the other end of the wire. So we need something that retains a value, whether it's a zero or a one, and this does it because whatever value this is, it gets negated twice, and if you remember the double negation law, if you take a 1 uh, or a 0 and negate it two times, you're back to the original value. And then that original value loops back and feeds back into the system again. So uh, when we get out here, we've got the original value of the bit, which we traditionally show in memory diagrams as Q. And to be honest, I don't actually know why it's called Q, but it is. Uh, and then what's also nice, and this is true for every memory circuit as well, uh, we have somewhere in there we can take another drop and get the inverse uh, at the same time of the, of the actual stored bit. So Q is our stored bit, and we'll also always have access to the inverse of that bit, which is useful if we're hooking that memory up as inputs to other uh, combinational circuits that may need inverted input signals because we'll have them ready to go. Now, the trouble with this super primitive memory is that there isn't a wire coming into it. Q is not a wire going in. Q is a wire going out. So we don't have a way to tell this to be a zero or to tell it to be a one. So it's a memory that remembers, but what it remembers is totally random. It's completely dependent on what it started with based on, I don't know, ambient electronic electron interference or something. So it's effectively random when this thing turns on. Right? Uh, and that's no good for us. So let's see if we can't change that a little bit. So one simple change that we can make is to go away from the inverter. And the reason to go away from the inverter is because it only has one input. So if we need to get the updated version uh, or the feedback version of the bit to push through the circuit, and this element only has one input, then we have no other inputs available to us to control things. So what we can do is replace the inversion functionality with some other circuit. And I like to do this with NOR gates. And the reason is because anything NORed with itself is going to be the opposite of that thing. It'll be the inversion of it. And down here I've got a truth table for NOR, so we can see that this is true. Zero NORed with zero is a one, and one NORed with one is a zero. So with a now two input NOR gate, we have additional inputs that we can play with instead of just one. And we're still producing uh, that basic flow of two inversions, a double negative. So let's look through this because I've also 
physically rearrange these in the diagrams to be one on top of the other rather than one in front of the other. Uh, and the reasons for that is for clarity as we move forward. So here is uh, our original bit value here, and it's being split to be the two inputs to an OR gate. So it's doing the same as an inverter. Then that comes pumped out, and here we see the inverse of Q. That's really this point in the top diagram. Uh, but then up here, the inverse of Q is fed into another inverter. That's what's happening here. We're feeding it back into this inverter, again, splitting it into the two inputs that the NOR needs. And then its output is the real bit, which is also fed back into the circuit. So what has this gained us? Well, it appears to be almost nothing, if not nothing, because that circuit does nothing different from the circuit above it. It just replaces inverters with NOR gates. However, because we introduced the NOR gates, we now have two inputs to those individual inversion circuits rather than one input. So we can disconnect them from the clones that we have right now uh, and possibly uh, feed some other data value there, right? Zero, one, whatever we'd like to try. So let's look at this one. This takes the secondary copies that were going into the two NOR gates from here, the clones of the original uh, lines. And instead of making it part of the feedback loop, we're actually just feeding it a piece of data. In this case, I'm just running it into ground. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I can really, if I'm just going to pick something to run to it, probably it's going to either be zero from ground or one from power. But let's look at the, the truth table for NOR on what happens in such circumstances. We'll call this, this input of ground what we're doing over here in A, where we could be doing ground, which is zero, or we could be doing one. So if we hooked it up to power and gave it a one in both of these NOR gates, well, the output will always be zero of these individual NOR gates. So that doesn't give us too much flexibility. But over here, when we're giving it zero, which is what we're actually doing in this diagram, across the variation of B, we actually get a varied output. In this case, we're getting the inversion of whatever B is. Now, up here, we said that anything NORD with itself is the inversion of itself. And that's great. But we also know, can, can discover quickly that anything NORD with zero is also its inverse. So that's what the top half of this truth table shows us. Now, that still doesn't look like it gives us very much, because that just means that these NOR gates are inverting, just like these NOR gates are inverting, just like these inverters are inverting. So there's no new data coming here. But what if we separate uh, these two lines, and instead of just feeding them both zeros, we do something else with them? So that's what we're going to do over here. Uh, and so really, the only difference between this circuit and the circuit that's here that's repeated several times. None of these are different other than what data values are on the wires. The only difference is that these two wires aren't bound to be the same value, which means we can make them different. So what happens when we make them different? Well, let's look at this one. I'll get out a, another color to do this with. If we have a zero down here on the R line and a one on the S line, then what's going to happen is the, uh, well, let's see if we can figure this out. Because the, the other problem is back here, we don't know what's on these wires. It could be anything when we turn this on or at some point later in the processing of our, our system. So what can we get here? Well, uh, we know that if we nor anything with a one, we're guaranteed to get a zero. If we nor stuff with a zero, we get the opposite. So this NOR with a zero is not going to give us too much information about what's going on here because we don't really know what this is. But we don't have to know what it is because we're going to suddenly NOR something with, zero, with one up here. And one NORed with anything is guaranteed to be a zero. So we're going to get a zero replacing whatever data used to be there. And then that zero is going to feed back into this inverter. Then we're going to have a zero NORed with this zero. So zero nord with zero is going to be a one. So we're going to get a one here. Now we've got to follow this through because that's going to feed back up here. 
So the one's going to feed back up into this NOR gate. Now we have a one NORD with a one. Before we had one NORD with mystery. But one NORD with anything, whether it's mystery or zero or one, is definitely going to be zero. So the output of this NOR gate is going to stay zero, which means the input of this is unaffected and the whole circuit reaches a steady state. And so if we start here, we end up with a zero here on the inverse of the bit and a one here on the actual bit. And this gives us our first insight into what this particular uh, circuit is all about. Now this circuit, as drawn here, is referred to as an SR latch. And the S stands for set and the R stands for reset. And when we put a one on the set bit uh, and a zero on the reset, that means we're not resetting, aka we're not clearing the bit to a zero, but we are attempting to set the bit, meaning put a one in it. And what happened? Well, even though we didn't know what used to be on the other end, whether the bit was a zero or the bit was a one, we definitely ended up with a one in the bit position, and the invert turned out to be reasonable. It's a zero. So if you put a one on the set while uh, having a zero on reset, then you're setting the bit to a 1. Now what happens if we don't set the bit, but we reset the bit by putting a 1 on the reset line and a 0 on the set? Again, we'll pretend we have no idea what the current uh, back end of this circuit has flowing in the, in the feedback part. But we definitely see that... Oops, I documented this wrong over here. We definitely see that the reset pin is set to a 1. For some reason I copied a 0 over here. I'll fix this side. We see that this is a 1, and 1 NORD with anything is a 0. So we know that the output here is going to turn to a 0, and that's what resetting means, clearing the bit to a 0. That 0 will feed back into the top NOR gate, and we'll have 0 NORD with 0. 0 NOR 0 is going to give us a 1. So a 1 is here. The 1 feeds back through the circuit. But a 1 NORD with anything is going to give us 0, which is what we already have in the bit. So nothing else changes and the circuit stabilizes. So setting the S pin to a 1, but not the reset pin, sets the bit to a 1. Putting the R pin to a 1, but not the S pin, the reset bit pin, uh, when we go active high, will clear the bit that we have in storage, meaning it will store a zero. But if you remember the circuit that we looked at just before this, it's right at the bottom of the page. Here we had a circuit where we were feeding in two zeros. So that's effectively saying the same thing as putting a zero on S and a zero on R simultaneously. And what did that do for us? Well, it gave us a circuit that was equivalent to this primitive memory. Whatever bit was in here, it just keeps feeding back forever and ever and ever and ever, remembering it. So when we have two zeros as inputs, we're actively remembering something. When we say set it, we're actively changing it so that it becomes a one. When we say reset it, we're actually making it have a zero in, in the bit. But whenever we want to remember this thing that we just uh, set it to, whether it's a zero, a zero or a one, we can drop uh, the two inputs back to zero, and then we've got this circuit, and we're remembering our bit of memory. And that's the actual memory part of it. Not just actively getting this one to feed back down here to the bit's output, or actively getting a zero to feed back to the bit's output. It's getting that started, and then using this to remember it by setting S and R both to the zero value. Now, that's what we see here. If we put the 0 here and the 0 here, it doesn't matter what's in the bit now, uh, Q. So the bit Q, we'll just say that's the value A. If we feed something back up here with the 0 in it, so 0 anded with anything is going to give us the inverse of that anything. So A becomes inverted. Now that inversion is going to come back down here with 0 uh, being NORD with it, but 0 NORD with anything is the invert. So the invert of A invert is going to be A. So out comes A. Nothing changes. Uh, the feedback effectively stops, and we've remembered our bit.
Now the real problem here is that uh, while we've seen what double zero as input does and zero one as input does and, and one zero as input does, the real problem comes if we were to ever put the S and the R pins to a one at the same time. If we were to do that, just imagine there was a one here and a one here, then the output of each wire is suddenly going to become a zero. And those zeros are going to feed back into here, right? And they're just going to stay double zero. And by itself, that's nonsense because we can't have a bit of zero and the opposite of the bit be zero. Uh, whatever this is, this should be the opposite. So what we want to ensure is with a circuit like this, whatever leads up to this circuit, it never ever allows the dual one input to occur because that would give us some bad circumstances. So the first thing we're going to do is try to eliminate that possibility. Now one way to do that is to recall that when we were supplying the S line with a 1, the R line was getting a 0. When the R line had a 1, the S line was getting a 0. So they were always the opposite of one another. And if they're the opposite, they can't be double 1. So a simple thing to do is replace the plain S line and the plain R line with a single input D for data that goes directly un unaltered into the top NOR gate and that'll function as the set and reset value because when we put a 1 on it we want to set the bit to 1 and when we put a 0 on it we normally want to reset the bit to 0. Uh, and to make that happen, when we put a zero on it, we'll come down here and reset, or not reset, we'll come down here and invert that signal into a one. So put a zero on D, you get a one down here. Put a one on D, you get a zero down here. And so that simple front end to the SR uh, latch that we had before suddenly turns this into one where it's physically impossible for the one one input on S and R to occur. However, this circuit then seems to be useless because if you look at it, that means whatever signal you put on D is going to get routed out on Q. And the moment you change D to from a 1 to a 0, the bit will change from a 1 to a 0. So you might as well just have a wire that you put a 0 on and have a 0 come out, or put a 1 on and have a 1 come out. It's close to that, right? However, one more simple uh, alteration to this makes it a lot more effective and useful. And we see that down here when we can suddenly allow active memory instead of just routing D to Q. And we do that by inserting a layer of AND gates. And these AND gates are working like transistors like we have seen before in other circuits like uh, multiplexers as an example. And so what we do is we run the original data line that would have gone into the top NOR and its inversion, which would have gone into the bottom NOR. They're just running into these AND gates as uh, potential signals to get routed out of the AND gate. But what lets them go through is this pin E, which is fed to both ANDs simultaneously. And the E stands for enable. So when the enable pin is low, both AND gates will spit out a zero, which means this circuit is remembering the bit that it currently has. When the enable pin reaches a high level, has a one on it, then each of these AND gates is going to pass through the other input, the one that used to be the equivalent of S and R. And so that means we can set the data pin to whatever value we want the bit to become, a one or a zero, and then we can bring the enable pin high. And as long as the enable pin is high, this thing will take on whatever value is coming in on D. Then we bring the enable pin low again, say with the clock going up and down and up and down. We bring it low again, and now no matter what's on D or how we change D afterward, this thing is going to get two zeros as the direct inputs to the NOR gates, and so it's going to be actively remembering whatever the previous bit was. When we do this, then we have something that we call a level triggered D latch. Now realistically, all latches are level triggered, but it's at this point that we really see this come to fruition. So it's just like our old D latch, but this one requires that extra input signal uh, and it doesn't actively take new data unless the level of it is high. 
but as long as the level is high, that bit starts taking on new value. So it could change several times during uh, the period that this enable wire is high. Now to keep that relatively short and predictable, we just hooked that E line up to a clock. And so this little box is the shorthand that we would see in a circuit diagram. You just see the, the main four elements are here, the data input, uh, the enable pin, which goes to uh, a nice symmetric periodic clock, uh, and as long as that clock level is high, this bit is taking on the value from D. And then we also have the uh, inverse of that bit being output. Now we can uh, step this up just a little bit more by doing nothing more than taking that enable wire and instead of hooking up this symmetric periodic clock to it, the regular clock, we introduce the circuit for the rising edge trigger clock. So remember this is the, the circuit that uh, goes from a low value to a high value and back low very quickly, little bleeps. Whenever the core clock transitions from low to high, but not when it goes from high to low and not while it remains high or while it remains low. Only on the low high transition. And in this case, then we have uh, an edge triggered system instead of a level triggered system. And uh, when we go to edge triggering rather than level triggering, we move from what's called latches to flip-flops. And that's really just a distinction to indicate which type of trigger we have. You can always remember that latches are level triggered because level and latch start with L, and flip-flop doesn't start with L, although it does have two Ls. Very confusing. Uh, so flip-flops are all edge triggered. We would never really call this an edge triggered D flip-flop. We'd just say it's a D flip-flop. And its uh, appearance in diagrams looks identical to the latch because it's just a latch with the enable source hooked up to a triggering clock. Now this is a rising edge trigger, but you could just as easily hook it up to a falling edge trigger or some other edge triggering circuit. Now there's one last uh, memory circuit that I want to show you, and this is called the JK flip-flop. And it is basically the same thing as uh, what we saw in the SR latch, uh, where we have uh, the two NOR gates with their own individual inputs. But what's different here uh, is uh, we have the layer of AND gates, same that we saw over here, to allow the thing to actively remember something rather than just pass uh, the current data on. Uh, and so these AND gates can't pass data into the NOR gates unless this edge trigger is beeping, which means the clock is transitioning from low to high. What also has to happen is we're going to have to, to satisfy these other two inputs. Uh, we'll have to be a one to get ones out of these for each of the two AND gates that we have. So these AND gates that we've seen before have just been beefed up to have three inputs. And we're going to route the uh, current bit and the inverse of the bits back into here. Now while we call this a JK flip-flop and the inputs are J and K, you can functionally replace these in your mind with S and R because they work the same way. In fact, uh, this particular flip-flop allows us to uh, put a 1 on this wire and a 0 on this wire and that will set the bit to a 1, just like having a 1 on S and a 0 on R. We could have a zero on J and a one on K, and it'll work just like having the reset pin high by itself in uh, the SR latches. And we'll clear this bit uh, or reset it to a zero. Additionally, if we throw a double zero here, uh, then these AND gates will both produce zeros, and putting zeros into each NOR, as you'll recall, makes it remember. So then it works just like the SR. The only difference is uh, how it functions on the 1-1 one, one input. With the SR, 1-1 one, one was bad, and we tried to eliminate that here. Down here, this alternate way to eliminate the issue is to feed the data back. So we know uh, from having double zero, zero one, or one zero as input, this bit is some meaningful value, and or this pin is some meaningful value, and it's the bit. And this pin is the inverse of that value. So whenever we throw a 1, 1 here, uh, 
Nothing's going to happen from that until this edge triggering circuit beeps. And so for the briefest moment, those ones are both going to allow these other bits of information to feed through the AND gates. Now one of them is a zero and one of them is a one. Right? It doesn't really matter which one is which. And what's going to happen as a side effect of that is the, the one of these that's a one. Let's pretend it's the bit Q down here. Uh, the one of these that's a one uh, is going to have its data routed through. The other one is going to be a zero. So if there's a one here and a zero here on the input of what looks like the SR, we're going to clear the bit to a zero, which is also going to result in this bit becoming a one, the inverse. Now, if we were to keep these on one, that could feed back potentially uh, and uh, make them switch over again. But remember, this is a flip-flop, so it's got an edge trigger. Uh, and that means these AND gates are going to turn off, basically, right after they let uh, the old two bits through. So if we had a 1 on bit Q, and we threw a double 1 here, then on the edge trigger, the 1 is going uh, to flip into a, uh, a 0, and the inverse will flip into a 1. If it had been the other way around, if before the edge trigger occurred, we had a 0 on the bit and a 1 up here, then double one here and an edge trigger will result in the two bits flipping their values. So with a JK flip-flop, the main difference from the SR is that uh, when we put a 1-1 one, one as input and the enable system, which is hooked up to an edge trigger, beeps, it doesn't set the bit to a 1 or set the bit to a 0 or remember it. It does an arbitrary toggle. It flips whatever the bit is. So with a JK flip-flop, we have a little bit more functionality. We can make it remember, we can make it a 1, we can make it a 0, and if we want, we can make it toggle. So with these various latches and two major flip-flops, we're able to produce a variety of memory circuits. But the key is these are sequential circuits whose uh, outputs are not just dependent on the inputs, but they are also dependent on the current state of the circuit 